This morning, we are in Acts chapter 21. If you would turn your Bibles with me there. Acts chapter 21. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning and just... Again, Lord, giving us a chance to come together as your people, as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. And as we've just been singing, Lord, to glorify your name, to glorify it above everything, above our emotions, above our feelings, above the circumstances going on in our lives, above of anything in this world that would try and bring us down, Lord. We, we want to exalt your name this morning. And Lord, we now have a chance to do that through your word. Um, and so we pray that your Holy Spirit, as he guides us and directs us and teaches us, Lord, that our hearts would be soft to hear what you have to say to us. That we would respond to your word. That we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word. Lord, if, if there's sin in our life, that you would convict us of it. Um, if we need encouragement or exhortation, that you would do that, Lord. You know what we need. and So I pray that you would be honored and glorified. You would fill me with your spirit as we open your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 21, as we're, um, well now we're really done with the third missionary journey of Paul, and now we're in his um, fourth journey, although it's not a missionary journey, um, but now he's going to be on his way to Rome, and we're going to see the beginning of that. But how this all sets up, if you've been with us for any amount of weeks, especially recently, you've seen that Paul has been warned that if he goes, when he goes to Jerusalem, it's not going to be good for him. He's going to be bound up in chains. You remember the prophet Agabus took, his, took Paul's belt and bound his hands and feet and says, you know, whoever owns this belt, they're going to leave Jerusalem like this. They're going to be met with this in Jerusalem. And they all knew it was Paul's belt. Um, and, and so Paul had been warned by, by others as well that if he goes to Jerusalem, he will be arrested. It won't be, he's going for the Feast of Pentecost, which is where we're going to see is taking place right now. But that's not, it's not going to be a fun celebration for Paul, as much as he'd like it to be, maybe. Um, and so, how he gets there, we're going to see that now. How, or how he gets in these chains. So this morning, we're going to, we're going to see what happens when Paul has been really wrongfully accused of something. I mean, have you ever been wrongfully accused of something? I, I know I have. Um, but what about, it, what about even by your own friends? We're going to see that this morning with Paul. And then also with Paul, we're going to see how, how, do we, how we defend ourselves when something like that happens. When we've been wrongfully accused. There's been a false accusation made against us. We're going to see how to defend ourselves or how, how should we. Um, and so... Starting in verse 15 this morning of chapter 21 says, And after those days we packed up and went up to Jerusalem. Also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So even with Paul and his companions, even though they knew there was trouble ahead, even though they knew that Paul was going to be arrested, and, and for all they knew, most likely they were as well. Throughout Paul's journeys, Paul wasn't the only one getting in trouble. His people around him, you know, guilty by association. But as they're going, as they're continuing on their journey in Jerusalem, we see actually a lot of love and faithfulness amongst the believers just here in these few verses. The first, we're told about a disciple named, and I'm just going to call him Mason. I don't, I don't know what the spelling of, or how to pronounce this guy's. I'm just going to say Mason. Um, this disciple named Mason. And one thing very interesting about this Mason of Cyprus is that he was an early disciple, Luke tells us. An early disciple. And a lot of people, you know, they, they claim different things of what that can mean. Some people claim it means he was actually there at, Pente at Pentecost. When the church started, he was one of those, or maybe he was one of those thousands that received and, and responded to the gospel when Peter stood up. 
Him being also from Cyprus, he could have been one of the very first believers that um, Paul had spoken to when he went to Cyprus. But nonetheless, we see that he opens up his house to Paul and his companions. He's now living in Caesarea and he opens up his house to Paul and his companions that they journey their way to Jerusalem. Now see, the reason I bring this up is this is something that wasn't just necessarily a cultural thing, although it was, being hospitable, we're told, you know, if um, probably many of you have heard that in the Middle Eastern culture, being hospitable is something that, that they do, and, and we say, well, we're Americans, and we don't. <laughs> but throughout the Bible, the Bible debunks that, that this is a cultural thing. The Bible says this is a Christian thing, to be hospitable, to open up your house. And really, uh, we're not sure if Mason knew the, uh, the prophecy that Agabus had given Paul um, or any of the other believers. But it would be an interesting time to know that, hey, if this guy goes to Jerusalem, he's going to cause a lot of trouble. And they certainly knew that Paul, wherever he went, usually wasn't welcomed with open arms nonetheless. Nonetheless, he, he opens his house to Paul and his companions. And we see this guy, Mason. And this is all we ever see of him. He's never mentioned again. Um, he doesn't write an epistle later on in life. Um, he's not one of the, uh, we're told at least in history, the early church fathers. But we are told about his simple love and faithfulness of just opening up his house to Paul and his companions. Probably, probably the last time of real refreshment Paul got. Real fellowship, unhindered fellowship with other believers was right here at this guy Mason's house. The next thing we see is in verse 17 is that the brethren in Jerusalem received Paul and his companions gladly. Notice it says again, and when we had come to Jerusalem, this is Luke writing the book of Acts, and Luke is saying, I was there with Paul. And when we came to Jerusalem, the brethren, the, the believers in Jerusalem received us gladly. Now if you've been with us at all through the book of Acts, if you've ever studied the book of Acts yourself, um, and we're going to see here even in a second, the church of Jerusalem was a great big church, but they also weren't the most inviting and comforting at times. People in that church seemed to have a lot of problems, especially with Paul, because Paul mainly dealt with the Gentiles. So to hear that the brethren, the believers in Jerusalem, received them gladly, with joy, with thanksgiving, Again, for these following verses that we're about to read, I mean, this is, this is big for Paul. This is going to be big for Paul. Because this is going to really, gonna, again, going to be the last big welcome he gets. From this point on, he'll be in chains. He'll be a, a prisoner of the, the Romans. Although he will say, I'm a prisoner for Christ. But I bring all this up and I focus on this just, to, just to, sh to say and to show and to point out that sometimes these little things that we think we were doing, you know, oh, I, you know, I just had, I just did this and, it, you know, it's not that big of a deal or, or I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to reach out. I'm not going to show some love or hospitality or faithfulness or whatnot because it's not that big of a deal. It's not like I'm preaching a sermon and changing lives or I'm not an evangelist and, and doing these great things. But the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write this for a reason. The Holy Spirit told Luke to make sure that he put in there that the brethren received him gladly. The Holy Spirit told Luke to make sure that he put that Mason received them in his house as companions. Him and his companions. To show us that sometimes even the littlest things that we can do for the Lord can be great. So moving along in verse 18, Luke continues and says, On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and, and all the elders were present. 
And we had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So now Paul and his companions go in to meet the elders of Jerusalem, the, you know, the, the bigwigs of the church of Jerusalem. He's got, he's got a, a board meeting with them. And he's done this before in Acts chapter 15. If you remember, Paul came to the, the council in Jerusalem and they were wondering, hey, what should we do with these Gentile believers? They're not circumcised. They don't keep the law. They love raw oysters and bacon. And, you know, what's the, can they still fellowship with us? What should we do? And in Acts chapter 15, the council decided, hey, you know what? We're not going to force, and you know, it, this stuff is not necessary for salvation. We're not going to force anything on them that we ourselves had trouble keeping, as Jesus told the Pharisees. So we're just going to tell them to abstain from worshiping idols, you know, abstain from sexual immorality, abstain from eating things, strang you know, um, strangled with the blood in it as that would cause your Jewish believers to, to stumble, you know, if you, if you invite them over and, you know, bacon-wrapped scallops or something, it's, um, it's kind of a, an insult to them. Even though they're believers, they still like to hold to the customs, as we'll see here in a second. But this is not the first time he's been before them. And so he updates them on, on what's been happening throughout the Gentile lands. The last time they saw him, they told him, go back into these Gentile lands and tell them, you know, that, hey, they don't have to keep the law. They don't need to be circumcised. It's Christ who saves them. Not the law. But the important thing to focus on is Paul doesn't just you know, give them numbers. Well, we went to Philippi and 1,300 people got saved and we healed 16 and I have a collection of $1,843.29 from them. Um, although I think if we send a more charismatic guy, we might be able to get more next time. He wasn't just shelling out the numbers and telling them this and that, but he was telling them how the Lord has been working. He told in detail those things that God did through him. And I can only imagine Paul, just by reading his letters, reading about him in the book of Acts, he was a passionate man. He was passionate about the Lord. He was passionate about seeing people saved. And so I can only imagine him standing before the council of the elders in Jerusalem and just telling him, you know, well, I went to Philippi and they didn't have a synagogue and then all of a sudden, like, I heard there was a prayer meeting down by the river and it was just ladies. I know, well, hold on for a second. Let me, let me tell you. I started preaching the gospel. Everyone gets saved. This one really rich lady named Lydia, she opens up her house. All of a sudden, there's a huge church and they helped me out. And I mean, he's just like, Telling them everything that's been going on. I met this other guy and we healed, you know, I was preaching one time. This guy fell out of a window. He died, but it's okay. He's alive now. <laughs> I mean, I can, I can only imagine him just telling, oh, the Lord did these great things. The Lord is working in the lands of the Gentiles, not just here in Jerusalem. I mean, quite honestly, that would be like in, in our day and age. Um, you know, we look, sometimes we see all the Lord's doing through these huge mega churches in these huge mega cities, right? In New York and Dallas and, and, and all over uh, LA, Atlanta. But it's just as great and it's just as encouraging to hear what the Lord is doing in Claxton, Georgia. Or Milledgeville. Some of y'all don't even know where those are or what those are. But that's what Paul was doing. He was coming back from these, these areas that people really had forgotten. People had um, said there, there's nothing that can be done there. And he's just saying the Lord is working in these places. And people are responding to his message. See, Paul was giving a testimony to the work. And one thing he does, is, one thing he doesn't do is take credit for it. He talks about how, what the Lord did through him through his ministry. Basically, what that, all that means is, I, I was available. I was willing. 
When the Lord told me to go, I go. When the Lord told me not to go there, I didn't go. I was being led by His Spirit. He was humble. And then we see what the fruit of giving God all the glory is. See, after He gives God all the glory, we see the fruit of that is, in return, those who you say it to, in the start of verse 20, and when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And in our own lives, if we're wondering, am I really giving God the glory? You should see why, do, when, you, when you tell people what the Lord is doing, are they glorifying you or are they glorifying the Lord? See, we, we need to make sure that we don't give people a chance to glorify us when we serve the Lord. Don't give them an opportunity to say, that was you. Man, you, you, you did so good this morning on, on guitar or singing or preaching or at the door or making the coffee. Don't give people a chance to glorify you. Don't give the enemy an opportunity to put that that seed of pride in your head. So far it's going great for Paul. They're glorifying the Lord. He's telling them everything that's happening. Just like we get to have, and, and by the way, I just got an email this morning from Chuck and Yumi out in Japan. They're going to be with us in the beginning of January. And so uh, they'll be doing just what Paul is doing and, and telling us all that the Lord is doing through their ministry in Japan. So keep them in prayer if you can. I well, know you can, but do it, do it if you will. So everything's going good for Paul, but the second half of verse 20. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. You can only imagine what's going through Paul's mind as he's hearing this now. It's starting to get worse and worse. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet. For they will hear that you have come. Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. So again, Paul seems to be doing well up until this point. Up until they bring up a false accusation against him. See, Paul had been beaten. He'd been imprisoned. He'd been stoned before by his enemies. But how does he respond to his own brethren when they bring up false accusations against him? And and in Paul's case, this is almost like a double brethren. Because he was a Jew, they were Jews, but they were also believers. How does he react? How does he respond? See, one of Paul's many thorns amongst the churches were these guys called the Judaizers. The Judaizers would go around really right after Paul would plant a church, it would seem, and go in and say, you know what? Yeah, Jesus Christ, he saved you, he died on the cross, he rose again. But Jesus Christ needs you to keep the law. If you're really really going to be saved, you need to keep the law. You Gentiles, you need to be circumcised. Or you Jews, you need to make sure that you observe the law completely. Even though you're saved now, you you need to completely observe the law. In fact, the whole book of Galatians is written in in the defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ by Paul to the church in Galatia because these Judaizers had come in and confused the church. And they, they weren't just saying that, but they were saying, yeah, Paul, he's not really telling you the whole truth. Paul's telling you to forsake Moses. And, and we as good Jewish People, we can't do that. We can't forsake Moses and the law. That's not trash now.
And of course, the church in Jerusalem kind of, they had a problem because there's the temple. Most of the believers there are Jewish themselves. And as, he, as they even say, you see in the ver- end of verse 20, you see how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. And they, look at all the thousands of Jews that have been saved and they, they're still zealous for the law. And so to hear that one of their main guys of the church, Paul, who's also Jewish, there's a rumor going around that he's forsaking the law, he's disdaining the law, that the law is nothing. Well, to them, this is a a PR problem. To them, people in the church are probably grumbling, saying, we can't support Paul. He's telling people to forsake Moses. He says that you don't have to be circumcised. So to fix this PR problem for Paul, the elders ask him to take four guys who were completing a Nazarite vow to the temple and pay for them to be purified. This was to show that Paul had no disdain for the law. See, if Paul were to take these four guys to the temple, be purified with them because... Him being a Jew here at the Feast of Pentecost, but coming from these outside Gentile lands, being amongst the Gentiles, he himself, if he wanted to partake of the feast, he had to be purified. You know, get the Gentile dust off to you and you know, make sure that there's no Gentile anything on you anymore. And so they said, hey, you go get purified. We also got four guys who need to go to the temple anyways. They're completing their Nazarite vow. And we want you to also pay for them to complete it. You know, because they would have to do different offerings to complete their vow. So he says, I, you know, to, to show everyone that you're not this guy that these other guys, these Judaizers are talking about, why don't you do this? Why don't you kind of, kind of go under this again? They even, they even say, look, at the, at the end there of, of verse 25. Or in verse 25, they say, look, the, the Gentiles, they don't need to keep the law, but believing Jews should still respect it, should still kind of hold, hold it high up, see its authority. The whole thing is kind of sketchy. In our modern context, I think we can look at this and say, this can't be right. This church in Jerusalem is is totally out of bounds. And as we see here in verse 26, then Paul took the men and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. We're thinking, they're out of bounds. And now how could Paul do this? He's just set back the clock, preaching grace, 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 and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and now he's purifying himself uh, according to the customs of the law, and also approving of four other young men to do that themselves. It seems like Paul messed up. Paul didn't want to be thought of, you know, he, he fell to the peer pressure of the elders of the church of Jerusalem. But Paul does it. But why does he do it? Why does he decide to take these guys and purify them? Purify himself. I mean, Paul could have easily said, you know, I, I'm, I'm righteous. I mean, he, he could have said, you need to read this letter I wrote to the Church of Romans about how I'm perfectly righteous right now. I don't need to be purified anymore with these ceremonial washings. He, I mean, he could have done that. Yeah, you know, here's the, here's, here's the first version. First edition. But Paul here is actually showing a couple of principles 
that he himself has preached many times. And I think we're going to see here, when we look at these, we're going to see that Paul was actually right. Paul was more right than we'd like to admit. Because if he was right in doing this, then we've been wrong for not doing it a lot of times. The first, the first principle that Paul shows us is to submit to the weaker brethren as long as it does not go against the word of God. See, in this context, the Jews, the ones who were so up in arms that Paul didn't completely, you know, he told people not to completely keep the law, that he told people that it doesn't save you, Or in this case, with these four guys who were completing a Nazarite vow, which Paul himself had taken. We just saw that a couple chapters ago. Paul himself took a vow before the Lord. But in this context, they were the weaker brethren. These Jews were the weaker brethren. Something Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians and Romans. See, there was nothing wrong with Paul taking a vow or helping these men complete one. Because in fact, this stuff, these ceremonies, had been established by God in His Word. We ourselves this morning could go back and read these same things that God said. And if we also know God's Word, we know that God does not change. Which creates, for some, it can create a problem or confusion. Because, hey, we're part of the new covenant, which says that we are free now from those things, free from the bondage of the law, as Paul himself writes many times. That we're free from the bondage of the law. We no longer have to, have to try and keep the law to be righteous. That Jesus Christ did it for us. So we no longer have to. But that does not mean that those things aren't still good. In fact, you know, if you've read through the book of Leviticus, I'm proud of you. And then <laughs> um, you'll also notice that there are a lot of, um, there are, there are a lot of clean things you know, that sounds like God's a germaphobe, basically. <laughs> When in reality, they didn't have the science and the technology we do nowadays. But God was ahead of his time, obviously. Well, he's outside of the time. <laughs> and when he would tell them, hey, you need to make sure that you're, you're clean in this way. You know, you wash your hands before you eat. I mean, you, you know, it, it wasn't God was just trying to control them. He's saying, look, trust me, if you don't, you could get sick. Something bad could happen. When God said, don't eat these certain kinds of animals, he wasn't saying, you know, trying to make them just eat bland food. It's because at those times, with what they had or didn't have, they could have gotten really sick or even died from, from eating that kind of stuff. God knew what he was talking about, believe it or not in the Old Testament and continuing on in the New Testament. So Paul himself wasn't actually breaking God's word. I mean, the Nazarite vow is actually something Jesus himself, John the Baptist, partook in. setting an example for us that it's okay. If the Lord leads you, you know, there are some believers who think, hey, you shouldn't watch TV at all, period. I don't think that's a commandment written in the Bible. I think that might, that's probably a good idea. You know, TV can certainly corrupt and, and it's something that we can waste our time with. But if that's the, Lord, the way the Lord has led you, then when I invite you over to my house, I'm not going to turn on the TV. And what, that, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm submitting to the weaker brother. 
Hey, to them, God has told them not to watch TV, not to partake of it. Now, I might think that's silly and that's, you know, crazy and, you know, this isn't the 1940s or something like that. That's what I might think. But, you know, that's the Lord, the way the Lord has led them. So I'm not going to try and stumble them. And the whole reason is not because I'm proving I'm a better Christian or that they're a lesser Christian or that they're a better Christian and I'm a lesser Christian. But it's out of love. See, Paul, again, was not doing this as a means to salvation, but as a way to honor God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23, he kind of explains himself of why he, essentially why he did this. I mean, he wasn't referring to this necessarily, but... He says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without the law towards God, but under the law towards Christ, again talking about salvation. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker of it with you. Paul says the reason he did this was not because he felt like he had to, not because he was pressured into it, but because he submitted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saying, hey, it will create more of a problem if I say no, and I could possibly mar the gospel of Jesus Christ than if I do it. I'm not breaking a, a commandment. I'm not sinning by doing this. But by doing this, I could actually probably... The gospel could go further through me humbling myself. And this brings up the other principle. That Paul would do whatever it took to have the name of God glorified, even if it meant becoming a servant. Even if it meant kind of almost getting a... You know, I, I don't know what the Jerusalem elders were thinking, but you know, maybe they were thinking, we're going to slap him on the wrist and he, we're going to make him go do this. Maybe they thought they were disciplining Paul They certainly had some sort of authority over Paul and, and Paul submitted to that authority because they tell him to go do this thing and Paul could have said, as, as he says in 1 Corinthians 9.19, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all. Paul could have said, you know, I answer to Jesus Christ and him alone and walked out of there and then started his own church down the block. But instead, he did something that maybe to us seems foreign, but really shouldn't if we've ever read any of the Gospels because it's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Every time, every time Mary said, you know, Jesus, you need to clean your room, he could have said, you know, Mom, I'm just going to make us a new house. Or, or, you know, Mary, I created you, <laughs> so you might want to back off a little bit. And um, no, I'm not going to clean, you know. I mean, throughout the life of Christ, we see him humbly making himself a servant. The fact that he made himself a man like one of us to be betrayed shows that Paul is not the one person to start this or do this, but he's just learning from his God, from his Father, Jesus Christ. And if you're a, a, a brother or sister in Christ this morning, you have that same father to learn from that yeah you know, I, I might be free from all men I answer to God alone you know only God can judge me you know get that tattooed everywhere only God can judge me even though that might be true the stronger brother sister submits that they might win the more for the sake of the gospel now again, that's not submitting to sin. You know, hey, if I go hang out with my coworkers at the bar after work, maybe, maybe there'll be a great chance for me to preach the gospel when they're all wasted. When I, I'll be the designated driver. Or, or I'll do this, or I'll do... No. That's not what Paul is saying here.
Paul is saying that he makes himself lower. But he does not. He does not break the law. He does not break God's law. Now see, if they had said, well, Paul, we want you to, to repent and say that every man must keep the law. Now I know Paul would, <laughs> he would have something to say about that. And he, he might say, no, I, I'm free from your authority. And maybe he might go start his own church down the street. <laughs> because that was unbiblical. That was against what God had wrote. That's against what Jesus had said. And as Paul said, even in, in the book of Galatians, if anyone, if myself or another apostle or even an angel comes and preaches a different gospel than the one that's been preached already, they are to be accursed. Anathema. Paul, what he did was he humbled himself, but he humbled himself to lift the name of Christ on high. See, sometimes we can get so carried away with trying to defend, to defend our own name that we mar the name of Christ. And Jesus did that. He was falsely accused, right? And when he was falsely accused, what did he do? He had a, a ten-point defense that he laid out and he brought in witnesses. No, he was silent. Because he knew if he was silent that the name of God would be glorified more than if he decided to speak up. And we need to be careful. We might be right. I'm right. It, okay, you are. You might be. But you've done more damage to the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah, your name's been glorified. Your name's been lifted up. Your name has been saved. Ooh, okay, I'm, I'm safe. I'm clean. And I still got my clean slate. Yeah, but now everyone in the office, even they know you're a Christian and now they want nothing to do with you because, hey, is that how Christians act? They drag everyone else down to make sure their name's okay. See, success in God's kingdom is not everyone loving you, but a lot of times it will look like everyone is against you. But if everyone is against you as... As Paul says, if God is for you, then who can be against you? Now verse 27, as Paul's been attacked from the inside and he humbly submits and he, he does this out of love for the sake of the gospel. Now verse 27, now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So now Paul's been attacked by essentially his own friends, his own church. But now he's going to be attacked from the other side, from the outside. So some Jews from Asia who were at Jerusalem for the feast recognized Paul and Trophimus from the time that they spent in Asia. Paul had just come from Asia, Trophimus being from Asia, Ephesus specifically. They see Paul, they see Trophimus, they know their companions, and they just assume, as Luke says in verse 29, that, hey, if, Luke, if Trophimus is in the city and Paul's in the temple, most likely Paul brought Trophimus into the temple. They assume that. See, in the temple area, there was um, really this outer court that was for Gentiles. Anyone could go in. They could kind of, uh, you know, if they had um, converted over to Judaism as God fears, God worshipers, they could still kind of partake of the things. But they still weren't Jewish. And on the, uh, the outside of that, or on the inside of that court, before you stepped into the next court, which was the court of women, it was a sign that said, 
They found it actually in 1935. Um, archaeologists did. The sign that says that hey, no Gentiles allowed. This is, I'm paraphrasing. No Gentiles allowed. If you step foot in here, you're taking your, your blood be on your own hands. We're going to kill you. And the blood is on your own hands for defiling this temple. And that wasn't just a, you know, it, especially out here in the, in the south. You know, there's the trespassers will be shot on sight. I mean, uh, you'd really never hear of that. You know, most people, that's just kind of, or beware of dog. You know, that, that's just kind of a scare tactic. Um, no, they were serious about this. They were so serious about this that the Romans actually allowed them to do this, even to Roman citizens. So this was, that they were, they were being worked up in their own eyes for a good reason. And they ended up stirring up the whole crowd. Since, I mean, they're already there for a feast. They're already ripe with religious zeal during the feast. And a riot breaks out and they beat Paul. Intending to kill him. Because he's the one who brought Trophimus in, which he didn't do, but they thought he did. So he's just as liable. However, kind of ironically to Paul's favor, the Romans stopped the riot and stopped them from beating him. See, at the feast at those times, there would be about a garrison of Roman, Roman soldiers, about a thousand guys, and they actually, their post kind of overlooked the temple. And so some, someone could see this huge thing happening, and they go get the commander. The commander comes in, and, and he is able to kind of stop them from killing Paul. And in verse 33, Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded them to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after him, crying out, Away with him. Basically, we're saying kill him. So this commander is actually um, named by Paul in chapter 24 as Lysias. Um, and he wants to know why they're beating him. And why are you beating this guy? What's the uproar for? What's the riot for? See, Rome, as we saw before, Rome is not a fan of riots. So they want to know what's going on. But Paul never gets to speak. Well, not yet. He will. He'll get a great chance to speak, actually. But he doesn't get to answer that question, why he's being beaten here, right now. The crowd is so whipped into a frenzy that, that the commander could not understand it. You know? Some are saying, he did this. Some are saying, he did that. And he's like, you know what? I, I'm just gonna, we're going to get him out of here. It's obviously dangerous for him to be here. We're going to get him out of here. We'll throw him into the barracks, and we'll question him there. And even then, even as they're trying to get him out, the crowd is so bloodthirsty that the guards actually have to carry him because they're still, because of the violence of the mob, it says in verse 35, they're still trying to kill him while he's in Roman custody. The Romans have to literally carry him out. Now this will be the beginning of Paul's long and strenuous journey to Rome to appear before Caesar, um, which will eventually fulfill what Ananias told him and what he heard in chapter 9, that the Lord has set him apart to do his will to appear before kings and princes to preach the gospel. I mean, it would have been a lot easier if Paul was just friends with Caesar and could just walk in there, right? That, and that's how we think. When the Lord tells us that he's going to do something, we, we're usually thinking the easiest way. Like, hey, the Lord's going to do this. The Lord's going to um, get you a house. And you're thinking, well, I'm just waiting for that envelope to come. And all in the meantime, you have job offers coming. You're like, nope, the envelope's coming. I'm not taking that. That's too hard. The envelope's going to show up in the mail. <laughs> Most of the time, we just like to think that way. It's the easy way. It was not that. It's usually not that way, and it certainly was not that way for Paul. But we'll see that Paul was not worried about that. Paul wasn't worried about being wrongfully accused. Paul wasn't worried about even dying for the sake of Christ. 
He was not worried about his life or his name, but was worried about the lives of others and about the name of Jesus. Which is why he submitted to the the elders in Jerusalem. And we'll see next week and the following weeks when he gets to really preach the gospel to all these different people. Why he still stayed in bondage. Even when he's falsely accused by his own brethren and falsely accused by his enemies. When trouble is brought our way, we should humble ourselves and look to the Lord and he will get us through. In fact, if you would turn with me um, to John chapter 15. Um, other way. John chapter 15. I'm going to kind of end here. John chapter 15, we're starting in verse 18. Jesus is going to tell his disciples that exact thing. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they obviously didn't keep his word. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened, that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And and Jesus, that's not very encouraging, right? Jesus just says, they're going to hate you. They hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. A servant is not greater than his master. But that's not the encouraging part. Verse 26 of John 15. But, so after all the, you know, your life's going to stink, basically. But, when the Helper comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Jesus is telling his disciples there that look, your life is going to be hard. They're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. But I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to get you through these things. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit directly from God. Not like a, you know, I trained him to. No, directly from God. Because if we, if we, we read the Bible, we understand the Trinity, God, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit himself is the same. The same authority. So he's telling his disciples, look. I, and, and as he told them in another place, look, I'm, I'll still be with you because I'll send my Holy Spirit with you. And then I'm going to close with this. In Luke 12, verses 11 through 12, Jesus tells his disciples, specifically really relating to what Paul is going through there. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And again, we can get so worried about our defense and our name and, and if we're right and they're wrong that we sometimes forget the name of Jesus. We sometimes forget who we serve. We sometimes forget what, how Jesus lived. How He responded to these things. Sometimes saying nothing is good. Sometimes you do need to speak up. But whose name are you trying to glorify? Your own or Christ's? Just like we were just singing, and, and, and I love, you know, again, I just love to see how the Holy Spirit works because 
Um, the songs that the Spirit led John to pick out this morning. We're just so great for what we're talking about. About lifting the name on high above all. Above all things. Looking to Him. Glorifying His name only. Not our name. And so I pray that our lives would be, would be glorifying the name of Christ. Not our own name. Not our own works. Even if they're good works. Not our own ministries but simply the name of Jesus Christ. We do everything for the sake of the gospel, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, that we might win some. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just that you've given us that great example of a servant, of how a servant is to live, how a servant is to act. Lord, you've also given us that promise that we really don't want to hear, but it's true. Because they hated you, they will hate us. Because they persecuted you, they will... They will persecute us if we're, if we're glorifying your Father's name like you did. But let us take comfort in that you've not left us alone. You've given us your Holy Spirit directly from the Father to, to give us those things to say or give us the restraint, the self-control to not say anything. Lord, you've given us the ability now with, with your Holy Spirit to humble ourselves to serve you, even though we're free from all men, Lord, that we would be a servant. We would humble ourselves and make us a servant of all, that we might win some, just like you did, Lord. I pray that we, we would be known for the name we glorify and that it would be your name. I wonder if there's anyone here that doesn't glorify your name. They haven't accepted you as Lord, as Savior. They've been glorifying their own name their whole life. That they would humble themselves. They would repent. and They would see the example that you set. As we see this world trying to exalt their own names and tearing each other down, Lord, you came on this earth to exalt only the name of God. And with that, you've lifted so many up. Including us today. So we pray, Lord, you would fill us with your spirit as we leave this place to do your work, to glorify your name, that we would listen to your spirit as he leads us, guides us, and directs us. It's in your name, your precious name, Lord. And we pray all this. Amen. Why don't we?